Welcome uh, to the AAC podcast, Editors in Conversation. My name is Cesar Arias. I'm an editor-in-chief of Antimicrobial Agents and Chemotherapy. And today we are recording live from my hometown, Houston, Texas. And we are very, very happy to have a distinguished celebrity with us, Dr. Maria Elena Botassi. I invited Dr. Botassi because I really want to highlight Hispanic leadership in, uh, in life sciences, particularly women. We're going to have a conversation, a real fascinating conversation with Dr. Botassi. And uh, just to introduce her, so one of our local prestigious newspapers says about her, she, they, she was interviewed in a, a, by the Houston Chronicle, and when she was talking about um, when, when to decide to go to microbiology, and she said, I was also fascinated with it, studying the actual bugs, how to detect them, treat them, prevent them, helping doctors figure out how to do their job. It was a fascinating aspect to me. I got to interact with people in medicine, but wasn't diagnosis or providing healthcare. The concept of epidemiology and public health was my aha moment, right? So welcome, Dr. Maria Elena Botassi. Thank you. Uh, she is a um, senior associate dean of the National School of Tropical Medicine, division chief of pediatric tropical medicine, professor of pediatrics and molecular biology and microbiology at Baylor College of Medicine. She's co-director of the Texas Children's Hospital Center for Vaccine Development and distinguished professor at the Department of Biology at Baylor University. Um, and she's also a vaccine inventor an entrepreneur for the developing world. So um, just as, as I do in a normal introduction, um, we, I, I want everybody to check our journal. We have outstanding paper. We just have a fascinating section uh, about the top papers of the year. And if you are a member of ASM, everyone here should be members of ASM, I hope. But if you are not, you just have to sus uh, uh, subscribe to ASM and you have 50% off in the publishing fees. So um, let's start with M Maria Elena. So thank you again for, the, for coming today. So how did you get here? <laughs> Tell us a brief story and how you've been in different places in the world. You come from, from Honduras. So tell us how you got here. Well, first, Cesar, thank you for inviting me to be in your podcast, which I hear it's uh, quite the uh, popular in itself, but also doing it right here, also where my hometown is in Houston. But how did I come to Houston or how did I end up being who I am? And you're right, I started not uh, necessarily in Honduras because I was born in Italy, but I was transplanted to Honduras um, by the fact that my dad was a Honduran diplomat in Italy that went back home. Um, and as you mentioned, um, Many topics at school fascinated me, but biomedical sciences really fascinated me. And then when I figured out that I could actually study microbes and that in Honduras we have, unfortunately, the fortunate thing that I could actually see the microbes for real um, throughout my studies, not necessarily on a computer screen, but really, you know, how they affect uh, many people uh, um, in our communities gave me that aha moment of not only understanding them, but also looking for how we can um, find solutions, solutions that would be uh, affordable, accessible, usable, understandable, and that uh, the only way that I could do that was at some level also expand my education came to the United States via the University of Florida. So it's kind of been an interesting loop, right? You know, from Italy to Honduras, to Florida, to Washington, D.C., New York, um, Philadelphia, and then back to the south, to Houston. Because when we came down to Houston was, uh, not only because there's the amazing Texas Medical Center, but it's because we wanted to really up our game by coming to a place that sometimes people even say it's a difficult place, but it's a place where it really connects all walks of life, all cultures, and at some level also within the microbiological sciences that we actually find the diseases here just in our backyard as if I were back in Honduras. Sure. So let, let's go back to your Honduras origins. So you are a woman, Hispanic woman in, in Latin America, 
with a culture that we know is very male-oriented, uh, that you want to do science. What were the challenges that you were facing there, and how that, uh, those challenges, overcoming those challenges, helped you to become a better scientist? So you're right, and I think uh, uh, this um, perception that we as women, and certainly women in science, don't probably have a, a, a voice, I think was uh, my, uh, the intention that I actually had to make my voice heard, and for that, I had to have the guts, so the courage of, get, you know, of making myself heard, and how did I do that? By really connecting with my professors, connecting with my then mentors and advisors that I created in the, in the university to get myself known. I think it also made a, um, a dent the fact that I was always a pretty uh, nerdy, very studious person, so I always had very good grades. So I was noticed because, of course, you know, as you know, in our universities, they always look at the, you know, how well of a student you are. And with that card, I was able to then, you know, uh, raise my voice advocate for uh, my interest in becoming a scientist. And then I, at some level, I did luck out because uh, who were eventually my mentor circle within Honduras were um, graduate level educated, you know, professors who also had had experiences abroad that went back to Honduras. And so they saw the need of building new, uh, certainly professionals, that at, at the same time could reinforce and strengthen the research and certainly the microbiological sciences in the country. Coming back to your nerdy comment, I, I heard that you like a Star Trek and not a Star Wars. <laughs> yes. What is that about? Well, I don't like wars to start, <laughs> right? But if you look at, and, and maybe there's an anecdote that because I was very studious, um, Every time I came home from school, um, Star Trek at that time was always at 6 p.m. at night on TV in Honduras. The old Star Trek, right? You know, the Captain Kirk William Star Chandler. Trek, right? Yeah. Uh, and so I always did my homework in front of the TV because I'm a person who needs to have the noise. I don't study in silence. I study with, you know. Me too. Right? You know, I have to have noise around. So it was always in front of TV watching the episode of Star Trek. And so then, of course, as you then grow older and you really uh, hear more about what the episodes are about, it's really what we do, right? New frontiers, innovation, um, collaboration, um, learning about differences between different cultures, aliens, right? How can we eventually bring um, society to, to work and, and, and understand yourselves better? And I think that's why I always uh, really enjoy the Star Trek concept. Uh, of course, I do also like Star Wars, but it's more like a, you know... Do better. <laughs> yeah, more like a, you know, okay, sure, it's fun to watch in, on, on the movies, but I think Star Trek really even has a, has a real message behind it. So let's talk about your, your, your step from, from Honduras to the United States. How was that transition, and were there any barriers, including language barriers and all that, that you have to deal with? So... It, it was scary, right? Because even though I did go to an American school and in theory I spoke English, um, I trained and I did my undergraduate in a university which, you know, may not have a name, may not be known as much. Um, so I was scared of the fact that would I know enough to get into a master? I actually went, went to University of Florida first as a master um, program, and then they have, in fact, they shut down the master program and they asked if, of those of us who had the good grades, if we wanted to apply for a PhD. So then I went straight into a PhD. And, and so the scare of, do I know enough? Will I be able to um, be at the same level, right, of the other peers? And my surprise, to be very honest, I was actually at some level at an advantage because, again, I went into a immunology, um, pathology, which again, microbiology here is very aligned with departments of pathology, um, studying uh, the area of um, infectious diseases and at some level, you know, even cancer-related infectious diseases. Um, and I realized that, in fact, I know, knew more than what I thought I knew. 
Uh, I think the shock was um, the, the way you study is a little bit different and the fact that I had to learn to even be more, raise my voice even more because you, ha you were thrown into you know, studying to do presentations, to write your, your, your you know, uh, practical uh, exams or you know, your oral exams. Those things maybe was a little bit challenging. But I very rapidly fit in, and, and it was a strength that I had, right? My uh, having studied in Honduras and having seen really what the microbiology um, uh, challenges are in our country, I could then really use it as my story to show that that's the reason why I needed to learn more the deep, you know, molecular, cellular, mechanistic, uh, uh, which is what I ended up then getting with my PhD. And and. You, you started having an interest in neglected tropical diseases. I guess your beginnings helped you to that. But, and, and then you start connected with the social environment of those neglected diseases. Tell us that, that, that transition and what brought you to that point. Yes, and, and you also have to, uh, maybe a little about my personal, pro, uh, I guess, family life is, is um, my family comes not only diplomatic, my dad was diplomatic, uh, you know, career, but also uh, I come from an agricultural cattle raising family. So Texas is very, very appropriate for me. I feel like I was, you know, when I was in Honduras, we used to go all the time to the farm where we were raising cattle, you know, for meat packing. Uh, but I witnessed that that even the changes from a Tegucigalpa and the uh, Olancho, which, you know, uh, it, it was also a big, big impact. So that, uh, that understanding of why there's poverty, why do people have no access to health, education, you know, that was always, I think, in the back of my mind. Uh, certainly when I came here, my intent always, I think, you always have the intent that I had the hope that I would go back, right? So what I came here to do is just to, to get a little bit more sophisticated training, but then to apply it back to the tropical infectious diseases we see in our country. But I think my, my luck was also that as I was, of course, doing my postdocs, and eventually then I met Peter Hotes, which uh, I met him at a very important time, I think, during, um, you know, right at the turn of the century, which was, you know, right when many things happened for also uh, global health, which uh, certainly the launch of the Millennium Development Goals, the fact that indeed, you know, foundations such as Bill and Melinda Gates foundations were funded, the aspiration of scientists to really launch the movement of open science, um, the fact that we had the hints of the concept of decolonization a little bit, of being more equitable in the partnerships, in the selection of how Global North works with Global South. I think that is what eventually um, incentivized me to, even if I were to stay in the US, I wanted to really go back to my roots of tropical medicine. And with Peter, it was perfect because he had the same, uh, you know, I guess, uh, vision. And then on top of it, I got a second aha moment, which was when I was doing my postdoc at Penn, which I knew that science was not gonna be enough. That certainly my diplomatic little brain from my dad's side, my financial brain that came from my mom because she's an economist. But then um, when I was at, uh, in Philly, the, the surroundings of all the pharmaceutical sectors um, showed me that you have to bridge science with business, science with diplomacy, science with um, equity, with um, human rights, with you know, looking more at the social needs for you, for you to have your science really reach the people that you want them to reach. So and let's go back to that equity um, concept that I think is one of the reasons I wanted to bring you here because you are being a sort of fighting for that but the best example of, of that situation is when COVID-19 hit. And as we you all know, the, the vulnerable people in this country, and of course talking about the, where the most affected by this, by different reasons. Um, so tell us your journey about this vaccine that, that now you are distributing to the developing world 
in order to bring some equity without thinking about profits or, or, or coming back to some financial rewards? Well, the, certainly the philosophy of our work always being anchored on open science and reducing any barriers comes certainly from our tropical medicine work because we knew even for a hookworm vaccine or a schistosomiasis vaccine or whatever vaccine, we needed to break those barriers of, of, um, um, of intellectual property protections or, or money, right? Because these are vaccines for the public good. The funny thing is that he was right when we were moving to Houston by the fact that we knew we were going to be close to the Galveston Labs and the University of Texas Medical Branch. The fact that we started hearing and seeing that, that, that emergence of these new, new and even re-emerging of infections, the, the pandemic you know, potentials, the biodefense issues right, that we have, that we decided to adopt coronaviruses in our portfolio of neglected diseases. And, and very honestly, coronaviruses by 2011, which is when we moved here, were pretty neglected already. SARS had already come and gone. Uh, MERS, you know, maybe hadn't yet, but it, no, it, was, it was not the same as you know, with the SARS. So we created a consortium. We decided to work since 2011 on coronaviruses, creating prototypes that would follow the same philosophy as we were building for our neglected vac vaccines, which was uh, collaborating with the Global South or, or enabling the, the technologies to be suitable for the poor and the, um, the areas of poor resource settings. So when COVID came, we, one, we were ready. Scientifically, we were ready. We had prototypes for SARS that we re-engineered for MERS, and then we re-engineered for COVID. Um, we had the teams ready. We had the documentation ready. And, and, and even though we didn't really have the money, we, you know, we initially convinced our institutions to say, let's, let's get on it, get on with it. Um, and, and honestly, that was our priority, to see how we could, we read the tea leaves that we knew at some level there were always going to be those left behind. So we stayed true to our philosophy. We, we picked recombinant protein technologies. We never managed to get partners within the U.S. to advance the products here. But we managed to engage an India producer, Biological E, a, an Indonesia producer, Biopharma, we now have Corbivax and Indovac. We've distributed more than 100 million doses of vaccines. I don't think I've ever thought of doing that 100 million remarkable. of anything, 100 million of it, and counting. And, and our privilege was to work. We, we wrote a, an interesting paradigm because the normal way that you develop vaccines, usually you assume that at some point, some big, large biopharmaceutical company will need to come and help. Like, you know, the AstraZeneca did with, you know, with Oxford, right? We didn't use any biopharmaceutical. We went straight from our lab in Texas. This is where Texas, everything is big in Texas, right? You can do great things in Texas. From a lab in Texas, we transfer our technology directly to India, directly to Indonesia, and they had to indigenously mature produce, empower, you know, own, advance, and eventually get authorization for those vaccines. And with Indonesia, we even went a step further. They actually certified it as the only halal approved COVID vaccine that exists in the world. Well, that's remarkable. So we are very, very privileged so and very is, happy. This is such a great story. <laughs> uh, so I... I you know, there are so many, you are such an inspiration for, for young women, particularly Latin women. So at this point, when we are, I think, advanced and a little bit more mature, what would you advise these young women in science to, 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 to look at the future and look at the future brightly? What would you, what would you, what would you tell them? Well, sir, first I would tell them to believe in themselves or, you know, you have, you have to learn who you are and believe in who you are and, and certainly capitalize on your strengths and try to find ways to improve, you know, your weaknesses, your blind spots, understands you. So understanding you is important. That will then give you the courage and the resilience 
that you have to, of course, you know, uh, um, you know, as you go through your career. You, the second thing that you have to do is you have to surround you with the right people, the mentors, the advisors, you know, friends, colleagues, um, family, right? You know, that it's your support system because they're the ones that together will, will allow you to open the doors or at least knock on the doors that maybe some will open. So that's the second thing that, you know, it's believe in yourself, surround you with a network. And then I think you have to communicate, tell your story, tell your story. And therefore with telling your story, you can really, you know, like you said, you are a role model. You are going to incentivize others to also believe in themselves, get that courage, and then surround themselves, you know, and so it, then it's kind of like, you, it's a snowball effect. Um, so those are my three, my no, three that, That's fantastic. So here in Houston and in general in Texas, we have great opportunities, but also have a lot of challenges. Social challenges, sometimes political challenges against um, our way of living, um, um, particularly with women. Um, I, I want to make sure people understand that the fact that scientific societies are coming to Houston to support us, to support you, to support all of us who are trying to fight in, against things that we don't want, but we, we need to be here and we are doing something for, for, for that. Um, what would the message be to, to you, for you to, to, all, to the, all the scientific societies that may be saying, don't come to Texas, don't come to Houston because it's not right? Well, my message is the following, right? I mean, if I wanted to do the easy things, I would go where, you know, it's easy. But, you know, easy things are not rewarding, right? I mean, I think that, you know, even sometimes I have to say, if we talk to each other and we're all scientists and we all already drank the Kool-Aid, you know, of course, we all drank the Kool-Aid. So, you know, you're, you know, so, so coming here it's indeed to step up our game and do things that we know are difficult right? And therefore, we do invite others to come and join us uh, because, you know, we need to make sure we improve human rights. We need to improve women's health rights. We need to improve um, everything, right? And, and what better place to do it where you actually ha can have the dialogues and the conversations. I'm actually part of... Um, so I've, I love Houston. I love Texas in general, but I love Houston especially because is such a diverse community, not only Hispanics, but from all over the world. Not only arts, food, science, um, everything is here. But it is challenging because we, have met, we don't have to agree on everything, but we need to open the dialogues for us to really show um, how we can be better in society. So for those who, who want to boycott Houston or Texas, because yes, you know, we have some very interesting politics or very interesting, you know, um, uh, science or health decisions. In fact, come because we need help. We need help to really raise the voices and we need to do the difficult things, right? That's why we're scientists. That's where we also were trained for, to look for new frontiers. Yeah, <laughs> amen for that. So you do a lot of work with Latin America and um, with very marginalized societies there. So um, I imagine you go and visit, uh, that has been my case, uh, and you, how do you change the environment, just going from what we just talked about Houston to environments where it's much more difficult, much more complex, uh, with poverty is rampant, and, and you see the eyes of these children that wanna, wanna get out of there, uh, wanna be better. So how do you change lives there? So the other thing I've learned is um, to really be very intentional and empower the actual communities. I think that's very important. I really like uh, also being here in Houston because we do a lot of community research and, and the communities is, is part of, of what we do. It's not that we do something for them and they're just you know, waiting for us to come with solutions, it's that we include them in the dialogue. So when, when we usually go to these field sites or, or very remote areas, the first thing is to ensure that the community is engaged and that 
for the most part, the solutions actually come from their own the ideas. And then we listen and we adapt our strategies to make sure they fit their culture and they fit, you know, what they really want, you know, the solution to be, right? It's easy for me to come and say, I'm going to develop a hookworm vaccine, but I don't really care whether they're going to be using it or who is going to be using it. I actually, we actually did a whole exercise of demand forecasting where we went into the community and we said, look, this is the parasite. This is what it does. We teach them because sometimes they don't even know what they even have and suffer. And they say, what about if we were to find something to prevent that the hookworm actually, you know, bleeds, you know, and, and, and sucks all your blood and you become anemic? So they help us in this discussion. So the engagement, the listening, I think it's, it's, it's a big part of what we do. So it's science beyond science. It's really engaging and communicating. And then they feel like it's the solution actually came out of their own ideas and not us imposing, you know, something to them. So my final question, how is this to work with Peter Hotez? <laughs> well, I love Peter. I mean, I've been working with him, oh my God, 23 years now, I, you know. <laughs> but um, we come, you know, it's... Does he change his bow ties all the time? He always <laughs> changes his bow ties, yeah. He does. He loves his bow ties. I change eyeglasses. I don't know if, so, if people know me. I mean, I've had all sorts of colors of glasses. Um, he changes his, uh, his bow ties. No, look... Um, we, we were raised differently, but we have the same passions. Uh, we have very different personalities. Again, so we learn how he, we, you know, I, I learn how he is. He learned how I am. We complement each other. But I think more importantly is that we respect each other and we understand our roles and that we advocate one for the other. You know, I always say that, you know, probably, and I always, I, I'm very frank with this, right? When you are co-director with someone, or even he's the dean and I'm the senior associate dean, you know, there's always this perception that, he, you know, he's above and I'm second. And it's always, like a marriage, right? right? And I'm the invisible one, right? I'm always, you know, you know, kind of like a step back, right? And he always is the first one to, to not only push me, but also ensure that everybody understands that there's there's equality and equity even in, in what we do. And, and that also is reflected by our teams, right? We have a big team of scientists and we run a school and everybody knows that it's, a, it's very matrix, right? Nobody's above, below or anybody. Everybody has their role. We are a team. We all, you know, have a, we're accountable. We all have our res responsibilities. But at the end of the day, we, res at, at the end of the day, we respect each other and, um, and, and we, we also get courage from each other. You know, Peter always says, I, you know, imagine having done this by our, by, you know, lonely, right? You know, the fact that we were together, him and I, and then together with our team, and then together with our leadership, with our institutions, you know, gave us the strength to do what was needed to be done, right? Which was try to develop, you know, certainly in, in the case of COVID, a COVID vaccine that will really go beyond the borders and beyond, um, beyond Texas and beyond the U.S. Dr. Botassi, it's been a pleasure. Please continue doing what you're doing. You are really a role model and an inspiration for all of us. Thank you, everybody, for being here. This is Cesar Arias, Editor-in-Chief of AAC, signing off. Thank you. <laughs>